We live in an electromagnetic world. And Maxwell's equations provide a complete description of how electric and magnetic fields interact and propagate through space and mediums carrying electric charges and currents. They are summarized in four fundamental equations. Namely, the electric and magnetic Gauss law, the Faraday's law, and the Ampere Maxwell's law. In this video, we focus on providing an intuitive conceptual understanding of Maxwell equations, as well as the basic phenomena these equations embody. Let's begin. Although it is my aim to explain the Maxwell equations with as little math as possible, I do not know of a way to do this without the two most important mathematical concepts in vector calculus. They are the concept of divergence and curl of a vector field, defined as shown. I shall use one minute to briefly explain what divergence and curl means intuitively. At any point in the vector field, the divergence is the amount of vector flux emanating from it. As illustrated here, when the vector flux are emanating from the point, we say it has positive divergence, and is often called a source. On the other hand, when the vector fluxes are pointing into the point instead, we say it has a negative divergence, and is often called a sink. If the amount of vector flux into and out of the infinitesimal volume balances each other, then the point has zero divergence. In similar vein, Vortices where vector fields are circulating also has zero divergence. How about curl of a vector field? Curl at a point measures the infinitesimal circulation of the vector field at that point. A clockwise rotation yields a negative curl or circulation. While a counterclockwise rotation of the vector field would yield a positive circulation or curl. As counterexamples, Fields that point radially inwards or outwards has zero curl. Just like streamline vector field has zero curl. Mathematically, the intuition behind divergence and curl are encapsulated in the Gauss and Stokes's theorems respectively. In a nutshell, the divergence theorem tells us that the divergence of a vector field integrated over the volume, V, must equals the amount of flux emanating out of the surface of the volume. On the other hand, the Stokes's theorem tells us that the curl of a vector field integrated over a surface, S, must equals the closed path line integral of the vector field over the perimeter of S. Thus, these two theorems relates the local behavior of the vector fields, namely divergence and curl, to its global behavior in terms of flux escaping and field circulation respectively. Check out the videos on Gauss and Stokes's theorem in this playlist after this video. Back to the Maxwell equations. First up is the electric Gauss law, which states that the local divergence of the electric flux density equals its local charge density. Taking the integral over volume on both sides of the equation, the right integral gives us the total charge, Q, enclosed by the volume 5, while the left volume integral can be rewritten as an integral of D over the closed surface of the volume through the divergence theorem. Thus, the electric Gauss law simply states that the electric flux density emanating out of an enclosed volume is equals to the charge it encloses. If the charge enclosed is unchanged, then expanding the enclosing volume would implies that the electric field strength must decrease with distance. Since the surface area of a sphere goes as the square of its radius, this implies that the electric field must depends inversely on the square of distance. For negative charge, the electric flux will be emanating into the volume instead. Let's extend this to the case of an electric dipole. In this case, the total charge enclosed by the volume is zero. Thus, we expect no electric flux emanating out of the volume. In other words, any electric field lines that escape the volume will find its way back into the volume. The electric dipole provides a nice segue for our next Maxwell equation the magnetic Gauss law, which states that the local divergence of the magnetic flux density is zero. Again, the divergence theorem will allow us to write the volume integral of the divergence as the amount of flux emanating out of the surface enclosing the volume, which must equal zero. Taking the example of a bar magnet, and choosing a volume that encloses it, 
we can see that the magnetic field that emanates from the north will return to the south pole, thus ensuring that the divergence is zero. To some extent, this is analogous to the electric dipole example. However, there is a subtle difference. In the electric dipole case, we can choose a volume that encloses only one of the two monopoles, thus yielding a finite divergence. However, this cannot be done for the magnetic field case. Choosing a volume that encloses only the north pole, we see that the magnetic flux that emanates out of the volume from the north still returns to the volume, yielding again a zero divergence. This is because you can never divide a magnet into its constituents monopoles. A bar magnet divided into two will produce two bar magnets, thus ensuring that the magnetic field's lines never diverges. The second law is thus also a statement that there is no magnetic monopoles. While the electric and magnetic Gauss law governs how their fields diverges, the remaining pair of Maxwell equations governs the circulation of these fields. The third equation is the Ampere Maxwell's law, which states that the curl of magnetic field is given by the charge current and the rate of change of the electric flux density. Let's begin with the original Ampere's law which is the embodiment of the phenomenon first discovered by Ersted, that a current-carrying wire produces a magnetic field that encircles it in a manner described by the so-called right-thumb rule. Ersted experiment confirmed a direct relationship between electricity and magnetism. By taking the surface integral over the area as shown, and using the Stokes's theorem, we can re-express Ampere's law in its integral form, which states that the circulation of the magnetic field around the wire equals the current that passes through it. Maxwell noticed that if he takes the divergence of the Ampere's law, it requires that the divergence of the current density to be zero. This is because the divergence of the curl of any vector field must be zero. However, the current density, which describes the flow of charges, should be allowed to diverge or converge, much like how any particle current flows would behave. Particle conservation would then require that the rate of change in particles number to balance their inflow or outflow from the enclosed volume. For the case of charge current, this would mean that the charge current emanating out of the volume must be balanced by the rate of change in charge Q enclosed within. Q is the total charge, which can also be written as the charge density integrated over volume as shown. Equating the integrand in the volume integral, we arrived at the well-known current continuity equations. For the electric Gauss's law, the charge density rho can be expressed as the divergence of the electric flux density, which then allows us to write the continuity equation as shown, as a sum of the divergence of the charge current, with the divergence of the so-called electric displacement current. Note that the electric flux density d is often also called the electric displacement, thus the terminology. Thus, charge current continuity requires the charge current to be also accompanied by the displacement current. With this new understanding, Maxwell fixed the original Ampere's equation by adding the displacement current to the charge current. Taking the divergence on both sides of the equation would yield zero as required by the property of vector field and current continuity. Let's see what the divergence of the two currents mean in the context of a capacitor wired to a time-varying voltage source. Taking an enclosed volume over the top capacitor plate, this means that the charge current entering the top surface will have to balance the electric displacement current on the bottom surface of this volume. The charge current can only flow in a material with finite conductivity, while the displacement current flows in any dielectric medium. On a related note, we also remark that the charge current is in phase with the electric field, while the displacement current is not. In fact, it behaves as a capacitive current, thus it does not account for Joule losses. The final equation is the Faraday's law, which states that the curl of electric field is given by the rate of change of the magnetic flux density. The Faraday's law was discovered through his famous iron ring experiment wound around on opposite sides by two coils of wire. The coil on the left was connected to a battery, while the coil on the right to a galvanometer, which measures the flow of a current. 
When the left coil circuit is electrically connected, the current in the coil generates a circular magnetic field which is guided by the iron ring to the opposite side of the iron ring as shown. This is the phenomenon described by the Ampere's law, which Faraday already knew when he performed this experiment. Faraday's discovery was found on the right coil circuit. Turning on the left circuit produces a temporaneous current in the right circuit, and an opposite flowing temporaneous current when the left circuit is turned off. The Faraday's law embodies what happened on the right side of the circuit. Consider a cross-section view of the right coil, with changing magnetic field as produced by the left coil penetrating its cross-section. First, let's take a surface integration of the Faraday's law over the cross-section of the coil as shown. The magnetic flux density integrated over the cross-section yields us the total magnetic flux, which we will denote with the symbol phi. Stokes's theorem allows us to write the integral of the curl of E as a line integral of E enclosing the surface, which is the definition of voltage over a closed path. We denote this voltage as the electromotive voltage, which is responsible for driving the instantaneous current through the right coil. Thus, the Faraday's law states that a time-varying magnetic flux would produce a finite circulation of electric field around the coil, or the electromotive voltage. But wait, is the finite electric field circulation in contradiction with electrostatics? Recall that in electrostatics, electric field is conservative, and we can always uniquely define an electric field in terms of the gradient of a scalar potential V. The curl of E is therefore required to be zero, since the curl of the gradient of any scalar function must be zero. Thus, the curl of electric field produced by charges must be zero and Stokes's theorem will require that its circulation over any closed path to be zero. Fields that exhibit such property is called a conservative field. On the contrary, the induced electric field described by Faraday's law is non-conservative in nature, since it has a finite circulation. Induced electric field forms closed loops, which implies that the work done by the force due to induced electric field in a closed loop is finite. We call this force the electromotive force. In summary, the electric field induced by a time-varying magnetic field is non-conservative. Now that we understand what each of these Maxwell equations is about, we are ready to discuss the emergence of electromagnetic waves from these equations. We first provide a heuristic explanation. We see that the electric and magnetic fields are intimately coupled in the Faraday's and the Ampere-Maxwell's laws. Ampere-Maxwell's law tells us that an oscillating electric current will induce a transverse circulating magnetic field around the current loop, which according to Faraday's law should in turn produce a transverse circulating electric fields, and so on and on. This alternation between the two forms of energy allows electricity and magnetism to traverse across free space. Mathematically, the electromagnetic waves can be derived by using the time harmonics version of the Maxwell equation, where the differential in time is replaced with J omega. We have also assumed we are in a current free medium. Taking the curl of the Faraday's equation, and making use of the fact that the curl of the curl of E is given by the gradient of the divergence of E minus its Laplacian, we arrived at the following. After making use of the fact that the divergence of E is zero in a charge free medium, The curl of H can then be replaced by E through the Ampere-Maxwell equation, which subsequently yields us the so-called wave equation for the electric field. Similar expression can also be obtained for the magnetic field. Solving this wave equations for a uniform plane waves, with the propagation defined along Z as denoted by the wave vector K. Maxwell equations require that the electric and magnetic fields oscillates in the plane transverse to K. The E, H and K vectors are all mutually orthogonal. Thus, this is also called transverse electromagnetic waves. The electric and magnetic fields amplitudes are related via the free space impedance, eta, and the electromagnetic waves propagate at the speed of light. This concludes our discussion of the Maxwell's equations and how it describes the interaction between electric and magnetic fields, through space and mediums carrying electric charges and currents, 
and the emergence of electromagnetic waves. Stay tuned, and subscribe, so you will be notified of our future episodes.